for the Dixie Chicks after their lead singer said she's embarrassed to be from the same state as the President of the United States. That story and more still ahead. Stay with us. Own a timeshare? Sell it for cash. Own a campground membership? Sell it for cash. Own a vacation property? Sell it for cash. Call right now for your free information kit to sell or rent your timeshare, campground membership, or vacation property for cash. Don't pay another mortgage payment, maintenance fee, or tax bill until you call for your free information kit. Over $1 billion of timeshares sold nationwide in the past six months. Every day, vacations only helps thousands of people to buy, sell, or rent their timeshares, campground memberships, or vacation properties for cash. So call now and choose the best to help you sell your timeshare, campground membership, or vacation property for cash. Call now and place your property for sale. Call 1-800-306-5300 for your free information kit to buy, sell, or rent your timeshare, campground membership, or vacation property for cash. Call 1-800-306-5300. It's a free call, so call now. 1-800-306-5300. You decided. Once again, CNN is number one for trust and experience. Americans choose CNN as the most credible news source. CNN is the most trusted name in news. Imagine being fired from your job because you've been called to active duty in the National Guard. That's what happened to one employee of Pep Boys, the automotive repair chain. Bill Tucker has the story. Manny, Mo, and Jack may be lacking a little patriotic pep. Petty Officer Eric Bellatus, member of the Navy Reserves, is suing Pep Boys for firing him after reporting for reserve training on June 27, 2002. The area and against any allies of the United States in the Middle East. So it is fair to say that although the picture that you're seeing on your screen looks deceptively peaceful right now, that uh, as uh, the, the uh, Pentagon has described it in a somewhat poetic turn of phrase, shock and awe is being delivered on the uh, Iraqi regime all over the country. As you can see, we're coming up on uh, almost 6 a.m. in Baghdad, 10 p.m. here on the East Coast. Uh, and uh, again, for those of you who may be joining us, and we assume people are tuning in, uh, as word spreads that the, uh, the long-awaited war against Iraq has begun, Ari Fleischer came into the White House briefing room at about uh, 9.45, about 12 minutes ago, to announce that the opening stages of the disarmament of the Iraqi regime have begun and that the president would address the nation at the Oval Office, from the Oval Office at 10.15. ABC's military consultant, Tony Cordesman, uh, is with us now. And Tony, uh, first of all, do you know anything about what's going on right now? We really don't, Chris. We were certainly under the impression that this might not begin till Friday, but there are some good reasons to try to make these strikes a bit earlier than we expected. Well, why don't we go through those? Well, one of the key ones is the possibility that Saddam's missile forces, the forces that might have chemical weapons, have been positioned or moved. Another is that he's dispersing key forces, things like the Special Republican Guards, the various security forces that he depends on. They're moving out of the target areas we've identified. He could be moving weapons of mass destruction deep inside the country. This idea that we preempt his ability to carry out a surprise attack to us is a possibility that many people in the Pentagon have raised. Uh, let me ask you, though, about, I think, one of the things that surprised us, and, and you and I were talking about this, in fact, in the hallways here at ABC earlier today, and that was uh, the, the unlikelihood that, uh, that the U.S. forces would strike so close to dawn when they would lose their uh, advantage of being able to f have so much technological superiority over the, uh, the Iraqi forces during nighttime. Uh, any thoughts as to why that wasn't uh, an overriding consideration? Well, I think there are several reasons. The main risk that you have in attacking in the light is that you would give up the secrecy you have in moving aircraft. The Iraqis have some air defenses that have optical systems, not just radars. 
but most of those systems have a fairly short ability in terms of altitude to hit our aircraft. And if we have any time urgent targets, then if we hit at this point in the day, just as dawn is breaking or while it is still dark, we have a long time window in which we can attack and we do achieve some element of surprise. It's probable that the Iraqis expected us to attack late in the evening, not now. Uh, we should incidentally, there is one uh, other interesting piece of news, and Tony, stay, uh, stay with us here. Uh, according to Reuters, a bulletin out of Baghdad, that the U.S. military is now broadcasting in Arabic on the Iraqi state radio fre frequency. One of the, uh, the key elements in this war the Pentagon has been very clear about is psychological operations, that it's not just simply a, a military drive to destroy the regime of Saddam Hussein, but also a psychological operation to, in effect, give the, uh, the Iraqis from Saddam Hussein on down the sense that the U.S. is going to take over the country. And obviously, if the U.S. military has now taken over Iraqi state radio, that has got to have some psychological effect. As we say, uh, uh, Tony, there obviously is a, a deceptively calm sky, what we're able to see over Baghdad. But you've been fully briefed. Give us a sense of what you believe the U.S. is doing in these uh, opening minutes of the uh, air war against Saddam Hussein. Well, Chris, one thing we need to be very careful about is that, at least in the past, there have been times when Baghdad has sort of lit up the horizon with anti-aircraft fire, and there have been only a few or no aircraft in the area. Now, we could be carrying out selective strikes for some very specific purpose, rather than launching an entire air war. Or we could be in a situation where the Iraqis were reacting to a false alarm in the radar. So what we do see, what we're likely to see, however, from the start of this is our special forces, which have aircraft that can take over their radio and TV stations with a very intensive propaganda and psychological campaign, and either the jamming of the Iraqi broadcasts or indeed the destruction of them from the air. Tony, though, clearly this is not some false alarm or some overactive uh, uh, anti-aircraft uh, gunner from the Iraqi side, since we know that the president is going to address the nation. I'm curious, why aren't we seeing, at least from the vantage point of this one camera, why do you think we're not seeing uh, more of an attack on Baghdad in this early stage? We have said that we're going deeply into effects-based bombing. We know that some of the things we need to strike at first are their air defense command centers. Most of those are far outside Baghdad. It's very likely that most of their weapons of mass destruction are dispersed outside the city in areas where we can't see them. The Republican Guards units, one of the key target areas, again, outside the perimeter of Baghdad. Even most of the large surface-to-air missile systems that are deployed around Baghdad are far enough away so we might not see the strikes. Let me ask you, do you believe, Tony, that uh, in fact the, uh, that the ground troops that the U.S. has uh, massed right on the border, right in the demilitarized zone between Kuwait and Iraq, do we believe that those forces now have crossed the line? You know, there's been a lot of talk about simultaneity, that uh, this is not going to be an air war followed sometime later by a ground attack, but in fact uh, that the U.S. would be hitting uh, Saddam Hussein's forces from all sides at the same time. Well, Chris, you raise a very good point, because we got the impression earlier today that those units weren't fully ready to launch the attack, and we were told, at least at one point in the Pentagon, that there might be three days of air campaign before the major ground force attacks began. We have also been told exactly what you said and that we'd get a lot of surprises. And there are some units like the Air Mobile Units, the 101st Airborne Division, the Brigade from the 82nd. These could be moving. We wouldn't really know about it. A lot of those movements could go deep into Iraq. They could be inserting special forces. Our allies, the Australians, have special forces in the area. The British have their SAS and also the 3rd Commando. So a lot could be happening on the ground, even if our major armored units aren't moving. 
You know, uh, Tony, and we rely on you for your expertise, and you may be right on in our, our trying to understand why this attack has begun now. I have just been given some wire copy. This is Associated Press out of Washington saying that U.S. forces launched a surgical military strike against a, quote, target of opportunity near Baghdad after U.S. intelligence detected the possibility Iraqi leaders were in the area. Uh, so there is some indication there that uh, perhaps uh, they saw their opportunity and they took it. Uh, Tony, uh, at this point, Peter Jennings uh, has arrived at ABC News headquarters in uh, New York, and we turn over our coverage to him right now. Peter? Thanks very much, Chris. Actually, we've been here for some time listening to you, trying to figure out exactly what's happening, whether or not this is the opening attack of this war, or whether, as you've already pointed out, we have a target of opportunity, and they saw some of the Iraqi Ba'ath leadership wandering around in the southern parts of the city, moving somewhere or another. But at the moment, after this period of calm that you have been talking about, we've managed to get Richard Engel for ABC News up on the telephone line. Richard, can you hear me? Yes, I can. And I gather you may be hearing other explosions at the moment, am I correct? They, they've been quite sporadic for about the past half hour or so. It started, well, a little bit more than half an hour. It started right before sunrise, and first the air raid sirens uh, started howling. Everyone, uh, I jumped out, uh, I'm standing on the balcony uh, overlooking Baghdad. I have a very clear view on the, from the 14th floor. Then there was a, a, about a 10-minute burst of anti-aircraft fire. You could see the actual uh, tracers going up through the sky. Uh, you, I couldn't hear any jets or any planes, so I had no idea what they were firing at. Then at a later stage, I did hear a, a jet pass over. Then it went calm. And then in the last few, few minutes, uh, a little bit outside of the city, uh, you, I heard another series of explosions. What exactly uh, they were firing at, it's not sure. But again, uh, the second time I did hear a plane flying overhead. This is, of course, very different than the opening of the last war, when, which in itself was something uh, somewhat misleading because the anti-aircraft fire that the Iraqis loose off trying to put up this curtain of lead from whatever against whatever is incoming has not been evident this time. So you haven't seen a whole lot of anti-aircraft going off, am I right? No, this was not the, the massive anti-aircraft display. It seems like, and I don't know, I, I, mean, I just t can tell you and only speculate based on what I saw, that this was some sort of test or that you know one aircraft was sent in to see what kind of thing they've got. There was not a massive uh, uploading of anti-aircraft, nor did I hear any major explosions of any uh, firing. Uh, or I, I couldn't see anything go up in flames. There's no plumes of smoke uh, around. So... It's hard to know exactly what had happened, but something certainly did and is continuing to, uh, seems to be continuing. I think I'm hearing explosions again. Okay, Richard, you listen for yes, a second. Yes, I am in the south. Richard, you listen for a second, and we'll come right back to you. But I want to go to John McCrethy at the Pentagon, because we've all been trying to sort out <clears throat> basically what uh, Mr. Fleischer said, the president's spokesman, when he said, John, that the opening stages of the disarmament of the Iraqi regime have begun. This does not, I don't think, necessarily means that an overall attack has begun, right? No, it does not. Uh, what it does represent, Peter, is the kind of flexible approach to this situation that the administration said they were going to take in the first place. Uh, this is a barrage of cruise missiles. There was a meeting at the White House this afternoon, uh, and although the plan uh, called for the opening uh, major air offensive to begin in several days, uh, they discovered or believed that they had a, uh, a target of opportunity to get some of the leadership uh, either through, well, various kinds of intelligence that they had been gathering. Uh, they determined that they were in a particular location and they went after it with a barrage of cruise missiles. Uh, they turned this around in a big hurry uh, and they have begun this campaign uh, way ahead of where they were planning to. Uh, I think it's open to question whether or not uh, they are now going to kick off some other aspects or if they are going to slip back into the major plan uh, that they had laid down uh, previously. Well, it's a tremendously interesting question because everything was so key. There was such a plan that the, uh, the ground units began uh, to move towards the Iraqi-Kuwaiti border this evening, all very timed, very carefully to move on the southern city of Basra immediately. John, if they decide... Not that the element of surprise is a huge component here because the Iraqis knew the United States was coming. If they, if they decide to play it by ear now, how much of a spanner, how much of a monkey wrench does that throw into the overall planning? 
Oh, I, I think it would complicate uh, quite a few things, Peter, uh, to, to deal with the kind of orchestration that uh, is required with so many troops coming from so many different directions. Uh, I think it will be extremely difficult uh, for them to execute the entire plan just at the drop of a hat. Uh, so I, I think they're going to probably continue to look for uh, moments of opportunity when they feel they can strike at the leadership uh, and go after that. This is also uh, another way of uh, forcing the Iraqis to light up their air defense system, gives the U.S. a very, very good look uh, at the different air defense frequencies. Uh, this is something the U.S. was probably going to do anyway, to do a feint, uh, to run aircraft mm. right up uh, to Baghdad and turn around and go away. It, it uh, may, it may, John, it may be, it may be, I just want to offer up an instruction to Richard Engel, if you mind. Richard Engel, I know you can hear me in Baghdad. If you wouldn't mind talk, turning on, if you haven't already, uh, Iraqi yes, state I'm radio. Okay. Have you turned it on already? Okay. Um, I have. I wasn't trying to... Uh, why don't you continue your conversation? I'll try and find this radio. Uh, you're trying to find the, uh, the report that the American yeah. military is broadcasting on the radio? Exactly. So if you'll listen for a second and see what the tone of, of the broadcasting is on Iraqi state radio, we'll go on and come back to you in just a second. Uh, John McCarthy again... Okay, I'm going to put down it, the phone. Okay. Uh, John McCarthy, it may be that the uh, huge flurry of activity is really just us to some extent here and that all of our attention gives the impression that an attack has begun when in fact this may have been an isolated target of opportunity attack and we go back to plan A originally. Uh, that may be what happens, Peter. I think it'll be interesting to hear what the president has to say uh, in a few minutes when he addresses the nation. Uh, I think what he's signaling is the U.S. will go after Saddam Hussein and his leadership uh, any time, any place, regardless of uh, any predisposed plans uh, that the military had laid down. Okay, I should tell people the president will address the nation in about four minutes, but this is, this is a very interesting report from Baghdad. Uh, which we're checking at the moment, which was first carried on the Reuters news agencies, which said the main frequency of the Iraqi state radio, which of course is the mouthpiece for Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath regime, uh, suddenly came on this evening and appeared to have been taken over by the U.S. military. I, do I hear it in my ear? I'm not quite sure. And the announcer said in Arabic, shortly after the normal Iraqi broadcast went off the air, this is the day we have been waiting for back to John McCarthy again because John one of the many many components of the new technological approach to to warfare is the ability to do this correct absolutely uh, absolutely There's a lot of deception uh, uh, number one and the ability to communicate uh, directly to the Iraqi people these are all part of the uh, the way the administration has designed uh, this war uh, both prior to the actual first uh, uh, acts of violence, the first bombing, uh, for weeks and weeks they have been trying to communicate with the Iraqi people. Okay, John, thanks so much. Just hang on for a second to go to the White House. Now, Terry Moran, um, who's our White House correspondent there waiting for the president to come out. Terry, the overall concept of this has been, at least in the public uh, uh, conversation of it, for months and months and months, has been shock and awe, which is this huge shock to the Iraqi system and this awe as a result. This is not the huge, noisy, everywhere assault shock that we'd anticipated. Unless you're a member of the Iraqi leadership, Peter. I think always that shock and awe was designed to shock and awe some specific people. Uh, this White House, this president, this administration have been very conscious of the potential pitfalls of large civilian casualties and a bloody war in Iraq. A quick strike aimed at decapitating some of the Iraqi leadership and sending a very strong message to anyone else in that leadership uh, might advance their goals without a lot of bloodshed. That shock and awe is designed to shock and awe some very specific people and kill some of them, too. Very interesting, too, because the first bombers, by the way, used in the, in the 91 war were the B-17s, or the, and they went in today. Um, so the first bombers in tonight apparently using the F-117s, apparently using some cruise missiles and some bombing today, and according at least to the Associated Press reporting out of Washington, this initial plan to go after the Iraqi leadership as a target of opportunity involved a handful of cruise missiles as well. And that may well be, we shall learn from the President perhaps in just a couple of minutes, why Baghdad overall, this city of a little more than four million people, 
uh, is quiet and seemingly calm in many respects as you look at the rising sun at about quarter after six. Let's go back to Richard Engel. Richard, have you managed to pick up the radio? Okay, we've lost him, which is no surprise. It's almost a surprise to have him under circumstances uh, like this. But Tony Cordesman, our principal military analyst, is with us. Tony, we've got just about a minute before the president comes along. Um, are you surprised at, uh, at this? Yes, I am, Peter, but I guess it's a tribute to the quality of our intelligence, the fact we can react so quickly and improvise a plan with so little warning. Okay, thanks, Tony. Uh, the president coming along in about 25 seconds from now. Mr. Bush, as you know, had a fairly quiet day. It was described as something of an eerie day at the White House. Everybody was quiet and somber today. There was no particular business. The president got his usual briefings from the intelligence staff and the military staff. Didn't go anywhere. Didn't talk to anybody of huge significance. Went for a walk with the dog and is now back to talk to the nation. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. More than 35 countries are giving crucial support from the use of naval and air bases, to help with intelligence and logistics, to the deployment of combat units. Every nation in this coalition has chosen to bear the duty and share the honor of serving in our common defense. To all the men and women of the United States Armed Forces now in the Middle East, the peace of a troubled world and the hopes of an oppressed people now depend on you. That trust is well placed. The enemies you confront will come to know your skill and bravery. The people you liberate will witness the honorable and decent spirit of the American military. In this conflict, America faces an enemy who has no regard for conventions of war or rules of morality. Saddam Hussein has placed Iraqi troops and equipment in civilian areas, attempting to use innocent men, women, and children as shields for his own military a final atrocity against his people. I want Americans and all the world to know that coalition forces will make every effort to spare innocent civilians from harm. A campaign on the harsh terrain of a nation as large as California could be longer and more difficult than some predict. And helping Iraqis achieve a united, stable, and free country will require our sustained commitment. We come to Iraq with respect for its citizens, for their great civilization, and for the religious faiths they practice. We have no ambition in Iraq except to remove a threat and restore control of that country to its own people. I know that the families of our military are praying that all those who serve will return safely and soon. Millions of Americans are praying with you for the safety of your loved ones and for the protection of the innocent. For your sacrifice, you have the gratitude and respect of the American people. And you can know that our forces will be coming home as soon as their work is done. Our nation enters this conflict reluctantly, yet our purpose is sure. The people of the United States and our friends and allies will not live at the mercy of an outlaw regime that threatens the peace with weapons of mass murder. We will meet that threat now with our Army, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, and Marines so that we do not have to meet it later with armies of firefighters and police and doctors on the streets of our cities. Now that conflict has come, the only way to limit its duration is to apply decisive force. And I assure you, this will not be a campaign of half measures, and we will accept no outcome but victory. My fellow citizens, the dangers to our country and the world will be overcome. We will pass through this time of peril and carry on the work of peace. We will defend our freedom. We will bring freedom to others. 
and we will prevail. May God bless our country and all who defend her. President of the United States, uh, showing up to everybody's surprise, I think, uh, which may well have been the intention that when the White House uh, left this evening, the President took the dogs for a walk, went up to the private quarters, virtually all the news agencies in town were told uh, in one way, shape, or form that this was not the night, and it may well indeed not be the night for the huge operation that, uh, that the U.S. has planned against the Iraqis, and we can get some sense of that because ABC's Ted Koppel, who is with the 3rd Infantry Division, um, has had a sense from his commanders that this was about to happen and I think is up on the line at the moment. Ted, are you there? I'm here, Peter, uh, and I can't tell you that I got this information from the commanders. Indeed, I did not. But there is a sense here that what has happened was, in fact, something of a surprise. They didn't know about it until about two hours ago. Uh, when they were warned to clear the airspace around here. That's the command that came through. And the apparent indication is that there was a target of opportunity in Baghdad. Now, that could be any number of things. It could have been that Saddam himself was seen moving around. That would, of course, be the biggest target of opportunity of all. It could have been that some of the Republican Guard divisions, which have been hunkering down in a defensive position, that one of them may have been moving and provided a right target. But I think you were quite right in what you said a moment ago, and that is this did come as a surprise. It even came as a surprise to the men of the 3rd <laughs> Infantry Division, most of whom have now deployed to uh, preordained positions up just short of the Iraqi border. That's where they were supposed to be. They're still there. Nothing has changed in their mission for the moment. Okay, well, then you've answered, you've answered the obvious question, or you've confirmed the question, which was target of opportunity, as, in fact, has been coming out of Washington this evening, because you guys are on something of a plan, have been for some days, and that, as far as you know, in the last 25 minutes hasn't changed. No, that plan has not changed, and nothing has changed as far as the 3rd Infantry Division is concerned. And I think you can obviously expect far more and far more intense air attacks and cruise missile attacks. What happened just a couple of hours ago, as I say, it came as a surprise not only to you back <laughs> in Washington, but to the men of the 3rd Infantry Division out here, too. What was the reaction in the division when it was happening? Well, quite frankly, Peter, there's not much of the division left where I am. We have stayed. What you see back there, uh, along with those little fires, which are just disposal of waste, what you see back there is the command headquarters that is quite literally coming down. They're pulling down, uh, and it's a fascinating complex of, uh, of tents, which will be set up again just a few miles south of the Iraqi border. Uh, so that the commanding generals have a place to which they can return until the ground attack begins. Uh, but very few members of the 3rd uh, Division are here anymore. About 75% of the fighting force is already, has already taken up its new positions along the Iraqi border. When I say along, I mean a few miles back. Ted, come back any time. Uh, it's, it's really uh, fascinating to see how easy we got you up at this point, so we'll let you go for the second, do your work, and come back whenever you feel like it, please. Ted Koppel, who is uh, out there with the uh, with the third division tonight, and this is a little bit of Baghdad earlier. No, this is Baghdad now. Richard Engel is in the uh, is in the hotel there, not the Rish not the famous Rashid Hotel, but elsewhere in town. Richard, you want to pick up this and tell us what's going on, or uh, best you know? Yes. Um there still seems to be some activity going on. I don't know if that is uh, focused on that, what they call that target of opportunity or not, but now somewhat further away from the city, I am still hearing uh, explosions up until a few seconds ago. They're quite distant, uh, so it's very hard to identify uh, where they're coming from um, and what they're exactly they are, but there's still this operation. doesn't seem like it was... Uh, over and done with. It does seem to be still continuing in, in some capacity, although it may have shifted. Okay, Richard, thank you very much. Just stay with us. Come back at any time. One of the things we know about the F-17 is it is the stealth fighter and it is uh, virtually invisible to radar. And this does remind us in a very minor way what it was like on the first night of the Gulf War. And we thought we were seeing one thing and we're seeing another thing. And as we look up into the night sky uh, 12 years ago, 
what we all collectively thought was an attack was in fact just a nervous, frantic reaction by the Iraqi ground forces firing at aircraft almost indiscriminately up into the sky. The F-117 F is virtually invisible to radar, so there's no particular reason why Iraqi radar um, will have picked up anything. But there will have been, clearly, if the U.S. has managed to get itself onto Baghdad radio, onto the national radio, uh, there will have been part of the shock and maybe even the awe that has been referred to. But again, I, we remind ourselves as much as anybody else that on the first night of the Gulf War we didn't know what the heck was going on. And it is probably true on this particular evening. Whether it's a target of opportunity um, or something we can identify, it takes a long period of time for bombing damage to be estimated and to be analyzed and to determine uh, whether anything has happened. But certainly it has set the dogs of Baghdad off tonight. Richard, anything else? Um, no, it's gone quiet. I've been searching the radio for a while and uh, I haven't uh, been, I didn't see it on, uh, I didn't come up with it on FM. Maybe they seem to be a uh, normal broadcast, a rocky broadcast with religious programming. And then I went through the uh, shortwave uh, frequencies and came up with a variety of, uh, of international programs that were carrying uh, President Bush's speech, including uh, a, a relatively strong signal from Radio Free Iraq. But that wasn't anything uh, out of the ordinary, but I'm still, uh, still scanning the airwaves as it were, Peter. We're very lucky because Richard Engel is an Arabic speaker. He gives us a very distinct advantage among among reporters because not many people do speak Arabic. It's about 25 minutes after 6 in the morning just to review uh, a little bit of the president in case you have, <coughs> excuse me, just joined us. The president came on and said almost at the top of his speech there that he was speaking on behalf of the 35 countries in the coalition. Um, a little more accurate appraisal of the actual battle components of all this. Uh, the U.S., of course, um, Britain, which has about 40,000 men, 2,000 Australians, 150 Bulgarians, uh, 360 from the Czech Republic. These are mostly <coughs> these Eastern European contributions concerned with chemical or biological attacks, and Slovakia has sent 75 people. But as the president then went on to absolutely clarify, because this will be seen throughout the world as a U.S. attack, when he said... Uh, to the U.S. military that the fate of Iraq and Iraqis depends on you. Uh, this is a sustained commitment the United States is making. The United States has no ambition in Iraq except freedom. And it's interesting because this is one of the first times that Mr. Bush, or for that matter anyone from his administration, has warned that the conflict might be more difficult and might be more costly than many officials and analysts have suggested. We'll have lots of opportunity to come back to that. To our military analyst, Tony Cordesman. Tony, as I recall some of our briefings over the last several weeks and months, there are at the very minimum about 70 potential targets in Baghdad which the U.S. is interested in. That's right, Peter. If we take a look at this wide area map of Baghdad, we're talking about the Special Republican Guards being in this area, his main intelligence service and bodyguard, the National Security Council. We're talking about three other intelligence services. It's almost amazing to consider how many targets, how many men, just to protect Saddam, there really are in this city. And the leaders of those units, as well as Saddam, are certainly targets of opportunity. Thanks, Tony. And of course, as we have we've watched the intelligence and watched as best we can the movements of the Iraqis. We get all this second hand through military intelligence and those briefings which the military give us. Uh, we've watched uh, apparently uh, Saddam Hussein and his inner circle draw his forces back into a variety of concentric circles around Baghdad. In fact the reporting from John McCarthy earlier tonight was that the forces in the south where the US forces have still not crossed the border in large numbers are largely regular Iraqi army and U.S. forces are getting signals that they may be disinclined to fight. Let's go to Qatar. Qatar is, is the home for this war of central command. 
uh, led by General Tommy Franks and ABC's Chris Bury is there. Chris, what can you tell us? Peter, we now have confirmation from a military official here at U.S. Central Command that, in fact, an operation aimed at regime targets was underway over Baghdad tonight. This is what they call the effects-based targeting, going after very specific goals, and in, in this case, it would be regime change uh, target, perhaps a palace or a ministry. We haven't been given specific targets, just that, in fact, an operation aimed at regime targets was underway. The only hint that we got uh, that this might be, something might be coming up is earlier, a senior military official suggested that we would see a big increase in the tempo over the southern no-fly zones, that mm. anything uh, the Iraqis had that could possibly threaten the U.S. and British troops gathered in Kuwait would be taken out. And in fact, mm. yesterday we saw several uh, major hits on everything uh, from uh, artillery batteries to surface-to-surface -surface missiles across the, the southern no-fly zone. This obviously is, is a different kind of attack, but we do have confirmation now that um, it was underway, aimed at regime targets in Baghdad. Um, as we look at a map, uh, of first of Baghdad, and then perhaps we could look at a map of the southern portion of the country. Is Ted Koppel still available to us? Okay, I think one of the things that Ted would have told us, and almost anybody with U.S. forces who are up along the border between Kuwait and Iraq. These, by the way, as we look at this map, this may be misleading at the moment, uh, because uh, this, is, this is the area of Baghdad which we are fairly able to see from our position there. And there, is, there are no huge explosions in downtown Iraq. We use the Al Rashid Hotel as a central marking point because it's been famous ever since the 91 campaign. But there's no indication, at least, that in this fairly tight area, that perhaps farther south on the edge of the city, based on what we've heard, there may have been a target of opportunity. What well, we will not know. It is all speculation at the moment. But as we go to the southern part of the country, uh, if we could get up a picture or a map of the, of the border of Iraq and uh, Kuwait, um, along the Kuwait border there from al Fa, which is on the peninsula just below Basra, which is the first city ground troops will encounter of any significance they go across. All American forces are deployed down there. It's basically the only way into the country which land forces can go. There have been a number of, there are just a huge number of forces down there. And they are all, get John McCrethy, our Pentagon correspondent on this, they are all, have all been anticipating and have been told to anticipate the possibility that in the days before a massive U.S. attack, there might be a preemptive attack uh, by the Iraqis using chemical or biological weapons. There were some reports, John McCarthy, earlier this evening that people had had to get in their, in their suits for a while. But, but uh, at least as of the moment, nothing of this nature has been realized. Not, it has not been realized, but there has been plenty of reporting in the last several days indicating that some of the frontline Iraqi units have now been given uh, various types of uh, chemical weapons. Uh, they know that because they have been given what are called binary canisters, which means uh, it is in a safe uh, mixture and when you actually arm the warhead you put them together mix them together and you get VX which is a very potent uh, and persistent nerve gas uh, Peter I have a, a couple of things to tell you number one um, they are now saying there were about 40 Tomahawk cruise missiles uh, that were used in this attack a very s uh, small number of F-117s uh, each armed with uh, a couple of 2,000 pound bombs were also used uh, this was, they were going after very senior leadership, and I think we can read into that. Uh, Saddam Hussein himself uh, or his two sons may have been uh, in the crosshairs tonight. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, the president this afternoon had a, had a sort of a quiet afternoon. He did meet uh, with what is called his war council uh, this afternoon, and they did make the decision that the intelligence was, quote, actionable uh, to go after uh, these very senior people. Uh, and it was just in the few hours after that that they were able to, uh, to mount this attack, which in military terms uh, was a fairly remarkably quick turnaround from going not at war at all uh, to this kind of a precision strike, or they will say it's a precision strike, we'll see. John, John let, let, let's do some basics for folks and we'll try to do it on a, on a regular basis because we refer to the Tomahawk, that is a cruise missile, it's sea launch, which means that the cruise missiles, Jack, would have been on their way for some time from the Persian Gulf. They're not very fast. Explain to people what they do. 
what these are relatively low-flying uh, missiles which are guided uh, in a number of different ways. They can both follow the terrain and they are guided uh, by GPS satellites, global positioning satellites. Um, they have about a thousand pound uh, warhead. Uh, they are very precise. Uh, some of these were fired from the Persian Gulf, we are told, Peter, and some, in fact, from the Red Sea. Uh, which means that they would uh, have to fly uh, over Saudi Arabia right. to uh, to make their journey. And you say there were about 40 Tomahawks were used tonight in a couple of flights of F-17s? That's correct. And and using the F-117 what uh, to drop fairly heavy, what, a couple of thousand pound bombs? Yeah, several 2,000 pound bombs, we are told. But of course, <laughs> in all of this, Peter, we must remember <laughs> that the early and first reports are probably going to be uh, fragmentary and partially wrong, but I think we do have it right that there were some uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles and quite a lot of them. Uh, they clearly wanted to uh, to have an impact on this target they went after. Okay, thank you very much, Jack. We'll come back to you as he continues oh. to, to work the, the story there. Um, ABC's Martha Raditz is at the State Department at the moment. Everybody has, uh, to be honest, taken a little bit off guard uh, by this and are still trying to figure out Martha, whether or not this is, you know, a pre-planned, it doesn't sound like it. It does sound very much like an actionable, as John said, an actionable target of opportunity. Does this mean, do we think that other people in the, in the coalition or other very close allies will have been told in advance that something was happening? Well, I suspect if they were involved in any way in the military action, you know, Peter, what I'm reminded of tonight is the 98 strike on Osama bin Laden's training camps in Afghanistan. Right. That at the time was real-time intelligence. They knew he was there. They sent cruise missiles up. The cruise missiles were launched from quite a ways away. It took too long for them to get there, and that's why they missed them. These cruise missiles are, of course, much closer to Baghdad than they were to Afghanistan, and they also use the F-117s, and that may be the reason they use those F-117s, because when you're dealing with real-time intelligence, you want your weapons there as fast as possible. Interesting, Martha. I'm going to ask our control room if they'd put up a map again, because John says that some of these crews, the Tomahawks, would have come from the Red Sea, not just from the Persian Gulf. Um, we might even get a map that's a little more, a little wider of the region of this. But Martha, what's interesting here, well, so much of it uh, is interesting here, is um, that intelligence in Iraq, human intelligence, for the last several years by the United States has been acknowledged to be, by everybody even in government, as appallingly bad. But it's got very much better, it seems, in the last couple of months, or so we're told, correct? Yes, I, I believe it has gotten much, much better, the human intelligence, as they call it. There are a lot more people talking. That may be because they thought war was imminent. There may be people who are trying to save themselves and in some way are talking. We also had a lot of people on the ground, which also may help. They may have been making contacts. Who knows who was in there and at what time? And of course, the United States had CIA personnel up in northern Iraq. There was, prob there was probably all kinds of infiltration into Iraq that we don't know about. But the human intelligence had improved a great deal. And intelligence officials that I have talked to said they were quite happy with it in the last couple of weeks. Okay, let's give people a sense of geography here. The Red Sea, of course, which goes up through Egypt and up to Jordan, the other side. Uh, there are very significant components of the U.S. Navy in the Red Sea. And if you look over there to the right, there's about a hundred and some odd ships wandering around the Persian Gulf in pre-described boxes, back and forth, back and forth. There were six, I think, uh, carrier groups in the region. Now, maybe there are five, and I think one on the way. But, um, but there's an enormous capacity both in the Red Sea. And if you look up even above Jordan and Israel and Lebanon there, there are other capacity to... to uh, you okay. Okay, let's uh, let's go. Uh, we're joined at the moment by Major General William Nash, who is one of our consultants. This he was commander of the First Brigade of the Third Armored Division uh, during Desert Storm. He's now a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, did this catch you off guard this evening? <laughs> well, it did, Peter, mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, we've been used to jumping up in the middle of the night and getting to the map board. Right, so, so what are your earlier impressions here? Well, I think uh, the assessment that uh, we heard from Ted Koppel is, uh, it seems right to me. The fact is, is that 
this is not a, a shock and awe attack that we've seen to date. Uh, the, the uh, Tomahawk missiles, the F-117 uh, sorties, indicate that they had some intelligence and thought they might be able to uh, pick off some senior leaders quickly. I have heard one report about uh, the uh, C-130 commando solo flights that have been broadcasting in Arabic uh, to the region, uh, trying to reinforce this. So they, it looks so far to me that there's a, this was a hastily put together uh, target uh, attack to go after the targets. General Nash, um, before long we may be calling you Bill. I hope you don't mind, but we'll call oh, you. Oh, I wish you would. <laughs> I call you Bill. In, in the '91 war, as I recall, it took about 90 minutes for a cruise missile to get from the Persian Gulf up to Baghdad. Am I right or wrong? I think that seems about right. You understand, I was in the middle of the desert at the time, mm. and uh, we saw the airplanes going over, but the cruise missiles were. Uh, coming on either side of us going in. But it, w it would very much argue, would it not, at the moment, that we, if, if they take, you know, anything resembling that, I know they've been, they've been vastly improved, but here was a target of opportunity in, in Baghdad, perhaps having to do with the leadership, we're not certain of that yet, um, that there would have been a fair amount of warning that, 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 that they were, that something was available and something was vulnerable. Well, understand that the uh, Tomahawk missiles may well have gone in on the known targets, the air defense and command and control centers necessary, and then the F-117s uh, who could be uh, directed to attack those targets of opportunity. Mm -hmm. The Tomahawks would be used as suppression, the 117s for the kill. Uh, let me go back to Tony Cordesman, uh, our military, our resident military consultant. Tony, tell us uh, briefly how precise can the cruise missile be and what are the disadvantages of it? Well, it can be amazingly precise, Peter. It's about twice as precise and reliable as it was at the time of the Gulf War. After the Gulf War, they concluded that 50% hit near the target. In recent wars, something like 80% at least have been hitting near the target, often within 10 meters or less. Now, the disadvantages are that if you can see it, it flies low, and it's possible under some conditions that you can shoot it down. But again, they've been improved. In the Gulf War, they had to fly very predictable lines because they followed radar mapping. Now they use GPS guidance, satellite guidance, and they can be programmed to fly flight paths where they can't predict the where, where they're coming from. And, and am I right, Tony, 90 minutes from the Gulf, and therefore how far from the Red Sea to fly across Saudi Arabia? Well, it's a slow-flying missile. I would think that basically you're talking at least a couple of hours. Remember that it has to go across Saudi Arabia. It also has to come from the ship. One other difference from the Gulf War is they can reprogram the targets on those cruise missiles in a matter of minutes, and it took a long time during the Gulf War. Okay, Tony, thanks very much. I think we can go now to Ron Claiborne. We can't. It's just information. Ron Claiborne is the ABC, our ABC reporter, who is embedded, as we say. There are several hundred uh, reporters from around the world embedded, uh, traveling with the U.S. military. And Ron is on the USS Abraham Lincoln in the Persian Gulf, and they are not blacked out. A lot of reporters with ground units are already blacked out, which means they're not in a position to broadcast because they're moving towards the front. But um, let me just tell you briefly what he says that uh, Admiral Kendall Card, uh, who's the commanding officer on the Lincoln, went on the PA system around 6 a.m. local time this morning to announce that the cruise missiles are ready to be launched. That Operation Iraqi Freedom, as the administration is calling it, began around 6.15 local. That's 10.15 in the eastern United States. Um, they played country and western songs, God Bless the USA, by Lee Greenwood, um, loudly. Uh, Captain Card is from Texas, and he had said he would play this when the war began. No fighter bombers uh, have been launched from the Lincoln tonight, but the Texan Admiral Kendall Card did say that that was the real sign that things had began when they played the Lee Greenwood song, God Bless the USA. Is Terry Moran at the White House? Terry, um, how, um, how involved has the President been in the nitty-gritty of this in the last couple of weeks? In the military planning, he takes uh, what he styles himself as an executive 
approach. I've been told that his style is to ask a lot of questions, to t play devil's advocate, but he doesn't pretend to be a general and he's uh, very careful in not making the calls, but he wants to be briefed a lot and he has now gone to calling twice daily meetings of this war council of the vice president who just left here, uh, the secretaries of defense and state, Condoleezza Rice, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and others. This is a style that he has of peppering uh, any aide, any cabinet department official and his generals with questions and he wants answers. So having spoken to the nation tonight, what has he done since, do you know? Has he, I mean, has he gone back to the, to the residence or has he gone off to uh, command headquarters? No, he's gone off to the residence. This, this is a president who is early to bed and early to rise and it looks as if the lights are off up there. Uh, he is back in uh, the residence. He left shortly after the speech. We did see Vice President Cheney here, which is significant since there has been a policy almost of keeping them apart quite a bit since September 11th. Uh, the National Security Advisor was here as well, but now all are going home for the night. Okay, Terry, many thanks. Um, various people on whom we rely tremendously are have, have beginning to gather uh, with us this evening. Among them is Lieutenant, former Lieutenant General Greg Newbold of the U.S. Marines, who's the former Director of Operations at the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the former Commanding General of the 1st Marine Division. Good evening, General Newbold. Good evening, Peter. Uh, what are your thoughts on, uh, on what we're seeing? Because it's a little hard to figure out whether we're seeing the beginning of the Big Bang or we're seeing just an isolated attack tonight. Well, there are several indicators that would reinforce the notion that it is not the Big Bang, and that is uh, that we know what the objectives were of uh, the overall air campaign, and what we're seeing now aren't consistent with that, but are in fact consistent with a notion that we're going after selected targets with the precise weapons that would be useful. Uh, in the case of uh, the Tomahawks, uh, launching them from seaborne platforms uh, makes them relatively immune from being picked up by observers uh, that might be able to uh, watch an air base. Because um, you, you actually, the, 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 uh, the crews, the Tomah any of the crews are slow enough, are they not, to be picked up by an observer just standing on the side of a road as they go by? Do you remember those pictures during the Gulf War of the guys going up and turning left? Uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, from the Red Sea and from the uh, Gulf launch baskets, as they call them for the Tomahawks, they would fly over uh, the sea for a portion of that time. Uh, another important aspect of the Tomahawks is they uh, fly with uh, low, with a flat trajectory and have a relatively small warhead. Uh, so as Tony Cordesman said, they are good for suppression and good for uh, light shelters. And the reason the F-117 is used is with the 2,000 pound warhead it can have a penetrator attached to it that allows it to, uh, as it's uh, as indicated, penetrate deep into bunkers uh, and command and control nodes. The, the F-17 is not very easy to fly, though, is it? Uh, no, it's not. But then it does not have to be uh, because it's designed to launch uh, its munitions from a good distance away under stealthy conditions, and it and it can launch them with great precision. So as the Navy ships were for the Tomahawk cruise missiles tonight, the F-17 is their platforms for which to launch these very, hopefully, uh, from the U.S.'s point of view, very precise weapons. That's right. Okay. We're also joined tonight by General George Dalwan, uh, who is a former uh, Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, a former NATO Commander in Europe. General Dalwan, nice to have you. Uh, you also caught a bit off guard here or not? Well, not, not really. Oh, uh, go on. No, I think uh. what we're going through now is a, a preparatory, preparatory stage in the, in the, in the build-up to uh, actual large-scale conflict. Uh, what you're seeing is, uh, is what the key word that was mentioned so far tonight is actionable intelligence. Right. We have reconnaissance, which we do reconnaissance in force before any large-scale movement of the ground force. So you have a lot of reconnaissance going on inside Baghdad in the southern zone as well as in the north Kurdish zone. So all of this is part of, of, the, of the preparation for the attack and, and uh, we might have had uh, clear indications from some of our folks inside of Baghdad that they have acquired a target and that's what I think you, you had the, the Tomahawk missiles fired which by the way are precise and very accurate 
and can be called in on precise targets. And that's what I think you've seen here. Uh, General, I have a couple questions for you. First of all, I should tell you that the British military spokesman in Kuwait tonight said that as far as he was concerned, neither the British nor the Americans had been asked to launch their ground forces yet, so you're absolutely correct on, on the first point. I think everybody agrees, maybe waiting for something else. But you mentioned intelligence. Uh, I, I think we all believe, rightly or wrongly, that there are intelligence assets that have been dropped into the country in a variety of places. But do you really believe that the U.S. would have serious intelligence assets on the ground in Baghdad at the moment? Wouldn't that be extremely difficult? Let me answer in a simple word, yes. Uh, I, no doubt in my mind that they're there. Uh, and they've been trained to do this, and uh, I think that uh, they're going to provide the sort of information and the disruption. What you want to do here is get inside their head in Baghdad, get them uh, talking much more uh, in the open, and I think you're going to see a lot of that. These are troops that are not well disciplined, that's why you saw all the firing. And I think hopefully our Joint Stars and other intelligence assets are plotting those positions which will be taken under fire when uh, this uh, larger scale attack takes place. So I think this is all part of the preparatory stage that you're seeing. Okay, thank you very much. The Associated Press, by the way, is reporting from uh, Baghdad tonight that, um, that at least on the state-run television broadcast, so television has come on in the morning in Baghdad. You remember this, if you just joined us, it was a report that the U.S. might somehow have managed to take over state radio and broadcast a sort of liberation message at the end of the regular uh, broadcast done by the Iraqi state announcer, all of them controlled by Saddam Hussein. And now the Associated Press that state-run television has come on and said, doesn't quite sound like something Americans would be saying at the moment, it's an inferno that awaits them. Let them try their faltering luck and they shall meet what awaits them. Richard Engel is still on the line with us in Baghdad. Richard, anything to add? Richard Engel? Hello? Hey, Richard, it's Peter again. Um, how, um, uh, how much, if, if you like, look out your window, what part of, of, of Baghdad are you looking at? How far can you see? How much perspective can you get on the town itself? It's a very big city. I'm. Well, I'm quite high up. I'm on the 14th floor, which makes me hope that these uh, these weapons are as precise as everyone is saying. Uh, but I have a very clear view of the uh, the whole city. It's it's sort of a, a misty morning. It's uh, sun. This 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 major barrage happened, or the, what was major, even if it was a minor barrage, but the largest part of it happened just right before sunrise. And um, most of the activity, it's it's still been sporadic. There hasn't been anything for about five minutes, but there are distant. Uh, explosions. I don't know if they're anti-aircraft or, uh, or or what they were. I, maybe you could ask some of the military consultants if if that's typical of a tomahawk attack that they would continue to have explosions even an hour after it uh, after it started, or if that would signal that maybe there's something more going on there that we don't know about. Richard, but as you're there's also an eerie. Yes, Peter. I was just going to say, as you're talking, we're going to roll again uh, the videotape of this cruise missile attack because. We were able to pick up uh, some of it as it was, it was occurring. Yeah, that's pretty much what it sounded like. Um, it was basically to the uh, southeast of where I am right now. I could actually see the uh, red tracer as the uh, anti-aircraft fire was going up. And um, first I heard the anti-air raid sirens and jumped out of bed and clothes on to come out of the balcony and see what was going on and we had really no idea because I was under the impression that if this was going to start, it was going to start big, it was going to be a major prolonged operation and it, it wasn't that so we were confused at first I thought maybe it was some sort of military test and a drill and uh, I think a lot of Iraqis are also confused. You see some people, there are cars driving around on the street, there's some kids sitting on the corner in front of me um, looking at a car just rounding the corner in front of the hotel. So it's not a, a city that has been, been shocked and panicked and is now uh, boarded up in their homes. Peter? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Th what you're looking at there, of course, uh, is I think we're now pretty accustomed to that's anti-aircraft. Uh, that is not incoming. That is outgoing. It took us a little while in the 91 war to, uh, to figure out precisely what is happening. Uh, but as, as we now believe, at least this is from senior military officials here, about 40 Tomahawk cruise missiles. 
uh, reported to John McCarthy, were fired from Navy ships in both the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, and a small number of F-17, the stealth fighter jets, not, not easily seen by radar, though one was brought down uh, in Bosnia during the campaign there. So if there's the fraction of access as there was on an F-15 in Bosnia, they believe, at which radar can lock on, the F-117 F is still vulnerable. But, but a small number of them tonight were used to fly in and drop precision guided bombs on what we've been told was the target of opportunity. And there are, senior officials also tell us, operational preparations taking place elsewhere, but this is not this is not a day, attack day, as best we can tell. This is not H hour, as everybody has been anticipating. And when the president and his spokesman earlier went on and simply said this was the first, this was the opening phase uh, of an attack which the president said, uh, along with the other members of the coalition nation, was intended to liberate the Iraqi people. John McCarthy at the Pentagon. Peter, we uh, now understand that they were going after at least two targets in different places uh, around Baghdad, so they obviously had some information about not where just one high-ranking individual was, but several. Uh, interestingly, on one of the ships uh, that was firing the Tomahawk cruise missiles, there are members of the press. So I assume that we will eventually uh, get some sort of report uh, from a, a reporter on one of these ships uh, when the missiles were actually fired. One of the points that you made earlier about uh, uh, the kind of intelligence in Baghdad, uh, part of the strategy of this overall campaign is going to be to break down uh, the ability of the regime to communicate uh, and by doing so you end up uh, harvesting a, a, a real bounty of intelligence because people who use uh, uh, one type of communications have to come out and use a much more open type that is easier for the US not only to intercept uh, but to triangulate and figure out where it's coming from. But John in some respects what I think confirms for us that this was not <clears throat> the, the real opening was the plans that the U.S. has for an astonishing technological attack. Maybe you could describe it for us in brief in order to paralyze Iraqi communications, both civil and military. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, when the U.S. decides to launch its overall air campaign, uh, it will be obvious and it will be spectacular in some ways, both uh, by the types of technology the U.S. uses their attempts to be precise, but also extremely lethal on the targets they're going after. I suspect that this uh, early attack, uh, Peter, is going to change at least part of the game plan. Uh, first of all, uh, this evening there was a plan to begin infiltrating special operations forces into various parts of Baghdad uh, to prepare the ground for later ground forces uh, that would move in to specific areas in the north, the western desert, and in fact in some areas in the south. Um, I don't know how that would be impacted, but I can guarantee you uh, that the air patrols over the southern and northern no-fly zones uh, of Iraq uh, are going to change radically in the hours ahead, uh, that the United States will go after many more targets of opportunity now that this war has begun. And, and do you believe, John, again, that, well, that when the, the balloon really goes up in a, in a huge way involving the massive amount of planes that they prepare to use, we're going to, to have a sense, uh, perhaps not just in Iraq, but beyond its borders. In some cases, somebody told me all the way to Europe of the electronic ramifications of using some of the weapons that have never been used before. Some, some of the weapons uh, do have that potential, Peter. Uh, those are fairly subtle weapons, actually, that you were talking about. Uh, these are information operations uh, where the United States becomes offensive, uh, in attacking computer systems that could end up affecting banking systems all over Europe and all over the world. Uh, I think the United States has backed off of some of those plans, uh, which is not to say that during the course of this conflict the U.S. will not be involved, uh, I think the U.S. will be involved uh, in, in getting into the lines of communication within Iraq, uh, telephone systems, computer systems, I can almost assure you uh, that if they are still functioning, the U.S. will be at least monitoring, if not controlling, uh, and providing some false information into those systems. Okay, John, thanks very much. Um, we're trying to bracket the country as best we can. We've, we've been on the southern border with, between Kuwait and Iraq with 
with uh, ABC's Ted Koppel. Now we can go to the western border, which was Iraq, where Iraq meets Jordan, and ABC's David Wright has been monitoring that border uh, for the last couple of days for us. David, what, if anything, is happening and or do you see from there? Well, Peter, just moments ago, we saw the first signs of air activity in this part of the world. Uh, two uh, small fighter planes flying overhead, something along the size of an F-111, although it's difficult to see from our uh, vantage point here. There's a Jordanian air base not far from where I'm standing that U.S. forces have been using, and when planes take off and land there, we are able to see it. And just to orient you, uh, I am about 350 miles due west of Baghdad. Baghdad is pretty much exactly where the sun is rising behind me. And U.S. forces and other nationals are using this as a staging area to go after targets in the western part of Iraq. Uh, these are thought to be some of the early targets as well because uh, it's from there that uh, Iraq launched Scud missiles at Israel in 1991. David, thank you very much, and thank you everybody else as well. We're going to, uh, c to conclude this uh, particular special report, which uh, uh, was designed as much as anything to catch up with what is as happening, um, because people uh, were, I think, generally fairly stunned to see that in a, in a, in a plan that was uh, so, it still is so programmed with so many components to it, uh, that the U.S. was flexible enough, as we had been told it might be, to go after a selected target this evening somewhere in the southern suburbs of Baghdad. We do not know yet what it was. We know what was fired off. Forty Tomahawk missiles and a couple of F-117s flew in. Uh, we're told that it may have been the Iraqi leadership itself, but there is no, uh, no damage assessment whatsoever and will not likely be one until tomorrow, if history is any lesson. And then the president came on, of course, and told us that uh, these were selected targets. This was the opening assignment, you will, of a war which everybody knew was going to occur when Saddam Hussein and his two sons did not leave the country tonight. Nobody expected they would, as the president had demanded they do, in order to avoid an American attack. Uh, we shall be back whenever anything else happens. You can monitor all the time at abcnews.com in many parts of the country. Your local news will be coming up on behalf of my colleagues at ABC News. Nightline will be later. Ted Koppel will be up there on the Kuwaiti-Iraqi frontier with the Army. I'm Peter Jennings at ABC News headquarters. This has been an ABC News special report. War with the Iraq. For continuing coverage of this story, stay with ABC News and abcnews.com. This is ABC. I mean, there's been a sort of constant wave of bombings and artillery aimed in that direction throughout the night. Um, dawn's broken here now, so it's more difficult to see the actual fireball. Um, but uh, during the night until about uh, 45 minutes ago when dawn broke, it was very clear what was going on all the time. The sort of barrage moved from the east, from Umm al -Qasr. I don't know if you've been directing your viewers towards that. Yeah. and it's been going westwards towards Basra, and then there was a very intense period for the last couple of hours, and it's still going on. I don't even know if you can hear it over the telephone. No, I can't. But do you know whether or not Umm Qasr has fallen to either British or American forces? Don't know that from our position, though. No. We're, we're pretty isolated here. We can only see what we can see rather than hear anything else. And can you, I mean, are you, are you with forces, or are you independent at the moment? No, we're independent. So, so can you tell us where you are? Um, I can tell you that I'm on the, um, on the border and um, uh, near the main artery that goes from Kuwait to Basra, about, uh, probably about um, 32 miles uh, south of Basra. Right, so are you, you're on the extension of Route 80 that goes all the way from Kuwait City up into Iraq itself? Exactly. Uh, we're off that route, but, um, but pretty close to it, yes. And have you seen an awful lot of traffic going north today? Um, no, uh, not a great deal. Um, I think a lot of the traffic was moved uh, in, the, in the previous days. In the last two, three days, there hasn't been that much movement, but there's been a lot of movement in front of us, in the DMZ and on the Iraqi side, of what um, you know, an educated guest would tell us of bulldozers right. and uh, heavy military equipment, clearing minefields, things like that, or clearing what they suspect might be minefields. Mm. I appreciate it very much, David. It's nice to hear your voice. David Fox of the Reuters News Agency on the Border. This is ABC News continuing coverage, live coverage of the war with Iraq.
Well, that is Baghdad by dawn. Six o'clock in the morning exactly in Baghdad. Uh, no air activity at the moment, though we do believe that uh, elements of the U.S. ground forces are, in fact, in some cases, racing towards the general area of Baghdad. If you just do minor calculations about the speed of operations uh, on the Iraqi side of the border tonight, uh, some U.S. forces are clearly traveling very quickly. We do not know what it means that there has not been a second level of attacks on even selected targets in Baghdad tonight, but that is what Baghdad looks like this evening. One of the many mosques, some of them small and neighborhood-like, as in this particular one, and some of them built by Saddam Hussein uh, throughout his reign, absolutely huge, and in the process, even now, in the western part of the city, is being built what he had intended to be the largest mosque in, in the world. We can go back now on the phone to ABC's Ted Koppel, who we haven't talked to in several hours, who is with the 3rd Infantry Division. Good morning, Ted. Good morning, Peter. Well, the ground invasion of Iraq has begun. Quite literally, one minute ago, the first tanks began moving across the berm. I'm watching them now. We are standing at the berm. We are still about 50 feet inside Kuwait, but the Abrams tanks are now moving across a long line of them. Uh, about five of them have just crossed into Iraq, and there is a huge, huge line of them. It's just after dawn here, and of course they're kicking up a huge amount of dust as they move in. But the, uh, the advance column here is made up of nothing but Abrams tanks. I assume that they'll be followed by Bradley fighting vehicles, and then you'll have the tankers, the support vehicles, the Humvees. There are going to be thousands of them passing across. Uh, quite literally thousands, 10,000 of these vehicles. Uh, one of the Bradley tanks that's going across right now has got a, uh, a rake-like blade on the front. Uh, they have been uh, clearing for mines, and they have had considerable action during the night. I just spoke to General Buford Blunt, who's the commanding general of the 3rd Division, and he was telling me that they uh, killed somewhere in the neighborhood, I believe he said, 11 tanks last night. So they moved a, the Iraqis moved a tank company up here to the border last night. They were engaged during the, the night hours. I say, fight is just breaking here. Were you aware that this battle was going on last night from where you were? Uh, no, we had no sense at all. Uh, we were about five, four or five miles back. Uh, we left, uh, we broke our small encampment this morning at uh, shortly before five local time. And uh, it took us just about an hour to drive to the border. And that's where we're standing right now. And is it I'm your... I'm hoping that we're going to be... I'm hoping, Peter, that we're going to be able to come to you with a live picture. We're firing up our satellite truck right now, and we should be able to come to you in just a few minutes. We'll certainly I, wait I, for I, at it. Least is it your impression that this advance across the border was timed to uh, coincide with first light this morning? Uh, well, I don't know if it was time to coincide with first light. Uh, General Blunt has been talking about uh, the timing of this. For, uh, uh, the timing has been changing quite literally, Peter, day by day. And uh, I know that uh, there was some doubt in his mind as to whether the invasion would take place today. Initially, it was supposed to begin tomorrow. I'm speaking now of the ground invasion. But I think then with the bombing of Iraq that took place uh, yesterday, everything was moving up 24 hours. But in any event, the invasion of Iraq has begun. It seems to be the case all across the border with the Marine Expeditionary Force having already gone into Iraq at another part of the border. Um, have you any sense of how long it's going to take to get all these tanks and and all these Bradley fighting vehicles across the frontier? Is there a, is there a, is there a schedule which you have any feel for? Yes, I have a very good sense of it. It's going to take about 20 to 24 hours. I mean, we are talking here about multiple entry points, as you've indicated. Uh, and when I talk about multiple entry points, I'm only speaking of the 10,000 vehicles for the 3rd Infantry Division, not the Marines. Uh, but these guys are going to be passing through these multiple entry points for 20 to 24 hours. 
before they are all inside Iraq. Okay, Ted, we'll wait for your pictures. Is there anything you want to add at the moment? No, I think that's it. I just wanted you to know that it started. Okay. Much appreciated. Ted Koppel with the 3rd Infantry Division. And if you were to look at a map of Iraq now, we'll invite our military consultant, Tony Consultant, Tony Cordesman, in here to help us with this. This is the invasion on the left side of the line of departure, on the western side. Uh, if you just zoom in on the map, you'll see the left side is largely desert, and the 3rd Infantry also has believed from the beginning that they'd have a fairly open path going out on the western desert uh, all the way up at least parallel to Baghdad. Tony Cordesman, tell us what else we should know at the moment. Well, Peter, you've outlined the core part of this because they're coming up through here. Now, all the other units, the Marines, the British Army units, are in areas where there could be water barriers and water crossings. These forces coming out of the Army are coming up a line of advance where there are still some water crossings, but most of the road up to Baghdad is going to be relatively dry, relatively quick. They can either bypass a lot of these towns through the desert or potentially seize a six-lane highway. And if they have the backing of helicopters, perhaps even use that to get to Baghdad quickly. Let me just give you, stay on your map for just a second there. You've got that little down the left-hand side there, Nasiriyah. That's about 230 miles from Baghdad, if I recall. And it's on the Euphrates, and it's surrounded by marshes in the, in the Euphrates Valley there. Does that mean that the tanks will stay west of Nasiriyah and, and just stay on the desert heading northwest? Peter, once they get out of this area here, there are water barriers, canals, rivers, through the area. There are also other bridges simply for viaducts and so on. But this is not the heavy marsh area. To get to the area where there are really major water barriers, you really have to be in and around here. So is this going to be easy? No. But do they face the kind of water barriers they would over here? It is easier to move through there. Of course, sooner or later, as they curve back toward Baghdad, they'd either have to loop all the way to the desert and then go between the lakes to the west of Baghdad or they'd hit water barriers near some of the Shiite shrine cities. Okay, let me go back to that map again and ask you another question then. Does, do, do you believe that the army is going to go to the east of Nasiriyah or is it going to stay? We take a look at our aerial map here. We have some sense of, of what this is actually what the terrain looks like. So the very light brown is desert and the inn, as you can see, a slightly hilly in some places and full of marshes. Do we believe that the army will stay outside in the desert or will go inside and have to go through some of that marshland? Peter, normally I'd say they'd go east, but there's a lot of innovation here. We don't know what's happening with the 101st Air Mobile Division. We don't know what the 82nd is doing. What could happen would be that these land forces might go both east and then up one of the main roads using helicopters perhaps to brush some of the Iraqi forces out of the way. And one of the advantages here is at least to the east, there are no Iraqi major divisions at all. And if they go up the other route, they can go a long way before they hit the Republican guards. Once again, U.S. forces going in, going towards Nasiriya, are passing another hugely historic place in the history of man. About 11 miles to the southwest of that circle, perhaps even within that circle, is a place called Ur, uh, the birthplace of Abraham. And no matter where U.S. forces go in Iraq, they are, they are wandering and attacking and driving through and near and by uh, some of the great cradle places of civilization. And one of them, as they go in tonight, Ted Koppel having said the first division has, or the third division has crossed into Iraq now, will be close to Ur. Now, uh, Ted is back. Okay, Ted Koppel said he was going to try to get a camera up this morning. Hey, Ted, it's yours again. Uh, Peter, can you hear me? Very clearly, Ted. Go ahead. All right, excellent. I, I, I must say I was, trying to think of, I was trying to think of something that would be appropriate to say on an occasion like this, and as is often the case, the best you can come up with. There's something that Shakespeare wrote for Henry V, wreak havoc and unleash the dogs of war. And there they start moving into Iraq. Uh, you know, I spoke to you just a few minutes ago as the very first vehicles went in. 
Uh, I'm going to ask the cameraman just to pan over now and you can watch this really endless line. Uh, there's a Bradley fighting vehicle going by right now, a couple of them passing through the border. Uh, and the line stretches in the other direction as far as I can see, Peter. And so what kind of a night has it been? For example, there's a large berm behind you which looks like it has been broken through. Is that what they spend the night doing, creating these openings? Actually, Peter, I have a feeling that there have been uh, engineers and uh, special ops forces in here for quite a long time. And uh, this last berm, they just broke through, I guess, during the course of the night. There is another berm about five miles up. They had broken through that. Uh, they quite literally just left the barbed wire in place, although I think they would even snip that before... Uh, before the invasion began, but symbolically that barbed wire was the last thing standing between these ground forces and Iraq. So talk to us a little bit now about logistics, because you talked about the Abrams going in first at the moment, and they're the greatest gas guzzler in the U.S. military, so where's all the refueling trucks for them? Right behind? Uh, the refueling trucks are coming, and Peter, uh, I'm trying to remember now, I think there are 350 uh, of the oil tankers. Each oil tanker carries some 5,000 gallons. Uh, and I did the math before. I couldn't do it otherwise this early in the morning. 1,750,000 gallons of fuel that they are bringing with them. And they have built a pipeline uh, through northern Kuwait all the way to the border here. Uh, and over these next few days, among the other things they'll be doing is laying pipeline right because they're going to be pumping oil all the way up from Kuwait into Iraq simply to support this enormous armored force. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the Abrams tank. It is the principal tank in the, in the U.S. military. It is vastly superior to the Iraqi tank, even though the Iraqis have some extremely good Russian tanks. It is the, uh, it is the biggest, the baddest tank in the world, and they are enormously proud of it. It has got huge firepower, and it is, at least from the front, and as you know, Peter, tankers maneuver so that they can try and approach each other so that they are coming from the front. The front of the Abrams tank is essentially in, invulnerable to anything that any mm. other tank can throw at it. Now, if they can get it from the top, if they can get it from the side, they can probably knock the tread off, but it's an enormously powerful tank, and it has huge firepower with it. And once you get into Iraq, the Abrams has the extraordinary advantage over the Iraqis of being able to fight at a greater distance. Uh, you, uh, of course, have put your finger right on it. They can, uh, they can fire from a distance of over two miles with uh, extraordinary accuracy, and I believe that the best that the Russian tanks have is probably mm. about a mile and a quarter or a mile and a half. So they can stand off and they can be killing enemy tanks and uh, the enemy can't even, uh, can't even approach them. Would you mind asking your cameraman to show us as, as, as much as we can within your limitations of the uh, environment I'm, you're in? Uh, I, was just about to, uh, I was just about to ask him to do that. Alex, if you would just turn the camera around so that they can see this long line. This is Alex Bruckner, and one Peter, of our... Peter, we will, uh, we'll see. I, I hope you'll forgive me, Peter, if on this occasion I say not one of our, he's the best cameraman we've got. <laughs> Alex Bruckner, he's an Austrian. Certainly his, this morning. That's right. His sound recordist is his, is his wife. They have seen uh, an extraordinary amount of service for ABC in many, many parts of the world. They've been in combat more times than I think they like. But when Ted went off... Uh, uh, to be embedded with uh, the 3rd Infantry. He was not dumb. He took Alex Bruckner with him, who's a great cameraman. You can see the line just stretching off into the distance, Peter, and, and you can see what is the bane of our existence out here. Those white clouds are just clouds of very, very fine sand. It gets into everything. It gets into the machinery. It gets into our eyes, nose, mouth. Uh, and it's almost impossible to stay away from it. And of course, when you're in convoy uh, with uh, these kinds of vehicles, the dust is just mm. everywhere.
Ted, there was quite a lot of talk before the 3rd Infantry crossed. Not over field telephone, but immediately transmitted uh, by touching the screen. The icons will move, and he can give directions to any of these tank commanders. I mean, quite literally, an individual mm. tank commander. Or they, if they are going into action, can communicate back to the commanding general who can then distribute the information all around. So the communications, I would say, is the biggest difference in, in terms of their fighting capability right now. Um, I'd, I'd like, Peter, uh, just to draw your attention. Alex, if you could just get a shot of that. You see the panel on the side of the, uh, of the tank? Or, or, you on, see the, that or on the corrugated Bradley. panel, Peter, on the side of the tank? Mm, I do. That's actually or the Bradley, the Bradley we're looking yes. at. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, no. <laughs> that, that is, that's, yes, you are right. We are looking at a Bradley. Right. Um, that corrugated panel uh, enables, there, there were a, a lot of instances of fratricide right. during Operation Desert Storm. And those panels uh, allow any fighting vehicle out here and any aircraft to immediately identify that vehicle as belonging to uh, the U.S. Army. So they are hoping that the instances of fratricide will be kept down to an absolute minimum. And maybe you could ask Alex to pan back for just a second to the left to pick up those guys who have, to their great relief, I think, got out of the back of their Bradley fighting vehicle. It's slightly misnamed as a fighting vehicle. It does have a 25-millimeter cannon on the top, and it does have an additional machine gun, but it is principally a transporter of men. And if they have to sit in the back, they tell us that it's a good, decent accommodation for six people, and sometimes they've got ten people in the back, and if you've got seven or eight people in full chemical suits, as you've seen Ted wearing at the moment, it is about as uncomfortable as you can get. And you do not want to be a driver of a Bradley fighting vehicle. I think, Ted, if you're, if you're taller than five foot four, Uh, I can, uh, I'm just a little bit taller than five foot four, and uh, I was inside a Bradley fighting vehicle the other day, and you're absolutely, absolutely right. Very, very little room. The squads, actually, you're leading into an interesting line of discussion because the uh, Bradley fighting vehicle normally takes a squad of seven, but in point of fact, the infantryman, as you and I remember him from uh, World War II days or, or Korean days or even Vietnam, the, in, the days of the infantrymen are not quite over, but uh, they are certainly diminished. This is a mechanized infantry division, and out of 20,000 men, only 1,200 of them uh, are actually infantrymen in the sense of, uh, on occasion, having to get out and walk. Uh, this is not one of those occasions. Everybody rides today. I just wanted to add one more thing, and perhaps you can do it even better than I can, about these thermal imaging panels which are on the side. They're sometimes on the roof. You can also see them, for example, on that vehicle just going by. You can see them on the back of a fighting vehicle as well. But they, this is another example of the extraordinary technology which is available to U.S. forces this time because it is the heat pattern from trucks and jeeps and Bradley fighting vehicles and tanks that airplanes and gunners pick up through their thermal imaging devices. Have I got that right, Ted? That's exactly right. Now, the, those side panels, of course, would be visible to other ground forces. Right. What they have is a special tape that uh, is put on top of each of these vehicles, and that tape is visible from, uh, I'm told, 13,000 feet up. I grant you it is quite a, an amazing sight to see. You said, I thought, 10,000 vehicles in this, uh, in this entire movement of the 3rd Infantry Division moving forward? That's exactly right. And there you see one of the tankers going through. And uh, uh, the men, you should know, <clears throat> have been told uh, that they were to bring enough MREs, meals ready to eat, enough food for five to seven days, enough water for five to seven days, and that adds up to an enormous amount of water because out here, Peter, it's still quite brisk and chilly mm -hmm. uh, because it's uh, shortly after dawn, the sun is just rising. But the men here are told that they should uh, try to consume three liters of water every day. Uh, and so three liters of water per man times seven, uh, just to carry 21 liters of water for each man. Uh, you can imagine how stuffed uh, 
those vehicles are. And if you look at the side of them, you can see that the men's duffel bags are on the side. One of the things that everyone is concerned about, of course, is if uh, in the, uh, the wonderful new parlance of the, of the modern GI, if they get slimed, they borrowed that, of course, from Ghostbusters. Right. What they're talking about is if they get hit by chemical or biological weapons, everything on the outside of these vehicles is gone. All of their gear, uh, which they tend to hang from the outside of these Bradleys and these tanks, uh, has to be uh, disposed of because they're not going to be able to save it. But as we watch these uh, tanks, and there again is an armored bulldozer going forward, um, reminded to add the importance of these panels on all of these vehicles because in Desert Storm in 1991, looking back at my fact book, Friendly Fire, uh, fratricide, as it's often referred to in the military, or blue-on-blue blue casualties accounted for 24% of U.S. combat deaths. So this is a not only a huge but a necessary step forward. Ted, I must say, um, the, the microphone you're using will remind some of our viewers of reporting from Britain during uh, the Second World War because that was, that's a sound exterior, sound suppressing microphone, which you very rarely ever see in the field. Yeah, which, well, you and I call them lip mics, and uh, we use them when there's a lot of extraneous noise, and as you can imagine, with all this heavy armor rolling by, we thought there would be so much noise that if we used one of our more modern uh, and tinier microphones, all you would hear is the sound of the armor, and. Uh, we wouldn't be able to talk to one another. All right. Uh, Ted, while you and I have been chatting, our, our principal military analyst, Tony Cordesman, has been listening to us. If we could just keep your camera up for a second, we'll invite Tony to come in and give us some sense of the overall tactic here, Tony, for Absolutely. the 3rd Inf Infantry Division. Well, I think one of the keys, Peter, here, and what you're seeing by going into the desert is to try to avoid all of the regular Iraqi units as long as possible. You probably may even be able to drive the Republican guards back on Baghdad. That gives the army the maximum speed. The difficulty where Ted is, we're not sure of the position he's using. It's easy to draw these lines on the map, but sooner or later, there are bridge crossings. You have to go across the Euphrates. If you go into that main road, there's something like 40 bridges in that area. Mm -hmm. And there are Republican Guards divisions in here. There's the possibility of chemical weapons. And you've got two corps of the regular army. Now, if the regular army stays in place because of the air, if the Republican Guards is cut up, and Ted's forces, the forces Ted's are with can move through these areas, we could be in Baghdad in a couple of days. If the Iraqis fight well and the US and British forces meet serious resistance, it could be a different story. You use the phrase core with reference to the Iraqi army. What is a core in Iraqi terms? Well, it differs according to where they are, but down in the area in the south, there is one core with three divisions. That's a heavy core by the standards of the Iraqis. It has a mechanized division, an armored division, and an infantry division. There's another regular Army Corps that has three divisions, but only one of those divisions has real tank strength. The other two are infantry. And again, when we look at the forces Ted is with, these U.S. forces are all professional, all trained, all volunteers. In the Iraqi forces, almost all of the infantry divisions are low-grade conscripts. Many of them are Shiite. Some of them even are assimilated Kurds. They have far less incentive to fight, very little training, very little professionalism. Let me call on now someone who has more experience with this than the rest of us all put together, and that's Major General William Nash, who's one of our analysts. He's currently a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City, though based in Washington. But in the Gulf War, he was commander of the 1st Brigade of the 3rd Armored Division, which is now defunct during Desert Storm and they were part of the main attack from Saudi Arabia into Iraq and fought the Republican Guard. So, General Nash, if you wouldn't mind, as we watch this procession of tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles and bridge building equipment go by, what would you be thinking? For one thing, where is the air cover at the moment, or is it necessary? Well, I'm sure that uh, Colonel, uh, General, uh, Bu uh, General B 
Buford's got uh, his uh, air cavalry assets out in front of the division at this right. point, uh, conducting reconnaissance and surveillance to his front and flanks as he moves through. Uh, there's no need for air cover over the column. Uh, the fact that the, the Iraqi forces don't pose an air threat to him. Uh, what he's trying to do now is get the division through the berms. Uh, the brigade commanders and the battalion commanders, as soon as they clear the berm areas, they'll go into combat formations that will allow the, the column, though, to widen. Uh, the forces will widen. Uh, they will also be able to close up, and uh, they'll start picking up the pace of their movement to around 15 miles an hour across the desert. Now, if you wouldn't uh, mind, if you wouldn't mind doing the math for us, just break it down for people who are not so familiar. How many men and how much equipment in a division? How many men and the equipment in a battalion? And break it down even further, how many how much equipment and how many men in a brigade? Well, to begin with, let's start with a company, Peter. Okay. And there's about uh, in a tank company, uh, there are uh, there, well, there used to be 17, I'm talking like an old sort of 15 tanks. Right. Uh, and with about 100 soldiers, a little right. bit less than 100. Right. Three, three to four companies per battalion. With their support troops, that's 500 folks. Uh, three to four maneuver battalions in a brigade, plus artillery, plus engineers, plus logistical support. Probably for this operation, uh, 30th Street Division brigades are running about 5,000 soldiers. Right. You put the division together, three brigades plus their artillery, uh, plus their aviation, plus their logistics, plus their engineers, uh, you're up in the 15 to 20,000 uh, soldier range. So the, the 3rd Infantry Division, as we see it uh, proceeding across the frontier today in front of us, about 6.30 in the morning, uh, their time, is somewhere between 15 and 20,000 men and how many tanks? Uh, he's probably running about 350 tanks uh, and a few more uh, Bradley fighting vehicles. All right, let me raise the, the bar just one more time. Many of these divisions and these brigades... Uh, Peter... These... Go... Yes, Ted, go ahead. Who look? Peter, can I... Ju uh, let me just jump in for a moment. Uh, you can probably see that a bridge is being put in place across a massive ditch that the Iraqis had built. Can you see it through the dust? Yes, and absolutely. between the vehicles as they go by, absolutely. they are laying that bridge right now, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure the general can explain to you uh, how helpful that is and how quickly it's going to enable them to open up uh, a new path through the berm here. Well, Ted, you're doing a very good job by yourself. Uh, there are a lot of ditches there on either side of the berm. These berms were partly built by the Kuwaitis on this side and partly built by the Iraqis, correct? Yeah, I suspect that the uh, the one you're looking at right now was probably built by the uh, Kuwaitis. This is the uh, the last little bit of Kuwait that these uh, armored vehicles are passing through right now. Uh, but this will enable them to uh, to open up yet another path. You've seen them all following this one path through the berm, uh, and now that they have bridged that uh, ditch uh, about a hundred meters over. Uh, I suspect that very soon feet. you'll start seeing vehicles going over that one, too. We've just had, Ted... What's, you what's 60 you, feet? You, you, you cannot see it, but we've just had one of those uh, rare uh, graphic renditions of a bridge, of a, of a piece of equipment that was absolutely perfectly fit with your description. And this, of course, General, will enable them to send two columns forward, not merely one. Am I correct? General Nash? Uh, right. That may well have been uh, just an exercise there, oh. because uh, the launch, uh, the, the bridge uh, vehicle was uh, exercising its capacity in that particular picture. I'm sure the division is using two to three uh, uh, crossing sites at this point as they move north. Uh, a division on a Actually, road... Actually, uh, if, if, if I may, General, General Nash, if I may just for a moment, uh, it's it's far more than two or three, uh, okay. and if if it were two or three, it would take them two or three days to get all this armor through here. Uh, they're going to be moving at uh, well, I guess now that they're doing it, uh, there's no secret to it anymore. They're going to be moving through anywhere from eight to twelve uh, crossing points. And that's and that's absolutely and, uh, necessary you can for the see speed that they get. 
Absolutely, and and you can see one of those bridges, quite literally rolling bridges. <laughs> the, the crew members are are waving at us here. I must say, uh, in addition to all the armor uh, that is going through here and all the equipment that these guys carry, I have yet to meet a trooper out here who doesn't carry his own camera, and we have probably been photographed more than we are photographing. So, so General Nash, continue. All right, hold on. Sorry. We have. Uh, Yes, as a matter of fact, I've got, uh, if you'll swing the camera around, Alex, please. Uh, this is Lieutenant Colonel Bayer. Uh, Colonel, why don't you tell them what it is you do uh, at the division here? Sir, I'm the uh, G3 operations officer for the 3rd Infantry Division. And in, in English, G3 means what? I'm, the, uh, I'm in charge of uh, planning, operations, training. Uh, so what you see going on today uh, has been developed by uh, my, my shop. Tell us what is going on here. What are we seeing as and, and how many different locations along the along the border between Kuwait and Iraq is this happening? Uh, for the 3rd Infantry Division, we've got uh, eight separate crossings ongoing now that all look very similar to what you see uh, here uh, with uh, several brigade combat teams currently crossing into Iraq. Uh, when exactly were the final preparations made here? In other words, when did you breach the last berm? The, uh, the the berms were breached uh, yesterday, uh, completed during the night in the hours of darkness uh, with uh, no issues. Uh, one of the great concerns, of course, as you head into Iraq has got to be the possibility of minefields. How do you handle those? Well, you, in fact, you see right here engineers crossing through the berm right now. Uh, those are specially trained soldiers who can deal with uh, breaching conventional and unconventional minefields. Uh, so far, I've had not have had no issues with uh, minefields. Since you're in charge of planning, tell us how you plan for that. Uh, maybe you can sort of give us a word picture as we're watching some of these vehicles go by uh, of how, in fact, a division like this manages to cross through a minefield with minimal and one would hope no harm to any of the American soldiers. Well, it all starts with uh, intelligence. We've had a pretty good picture of Saddam and the Iraqi army over the last 12 years. Uh, so we, uh, we've been able to determine how his forces were disposed and where he has developed uh, obstacles to, uh, to an attack. And as a result of that, then we apply, uh, well, we try to avoid them to start with. Uh, hmm. But if we can't avoid them, uh, we utilize the well-trained soldiers that you see here. Tell me about some of the equipment, though. I'm particularly interested in that. I was describing it to Peter Jennings, who's on with us right now. Uh, you have something that is almost like a catapult that flings little bomblets over a minefield. Why don't you describe it in, in somewhat more, with somewhat more expertise? I think what you're uh, referring to is what we call the Miklik, which is right. a, uh, it's essentially a rocket uh, that the engineers employ, uh, fires about 100 meters in depth, a uh, large explosive charge that'll clear a lane 16 meters wide uh, and free it of surface laid mines. It also does a pretty good job of mines that are buried underneath the ground. Very, very effective. You've been planning for this now for the better part of a year. Uh, there, there actually seems to be a smile of satisfaction on your face. I mean, this is going pretty well for you? Uh, so far it's going great. Uh, that's due to the great soldiers you see passing uh, through right now. Uh, but it's been a long road and we are ready to do our job. Colonel Baird, thank you very much. Sure, Appreciate it. Pleasure. Ted, can I get one more question Peter, to back the Colonel? To you. Uh, I was going to ask if we get one more question to the Colonel, but maybe you know. Uh, the, well, that's okay. Maybe you know the answer. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid the Colonel, the Colonel is gone. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I saw that. Um, it's very interesting, by the way. The, the, the United States has resisted joining the rest of the world in terms of meters and centimeters, but all the military uses meters instead of yards. But does he know how far in advance you the bet. minefields are at this point? Do they know what sort of opposition they found, how deep into Iraq at this point? Um, I, I mean, I spoke to General Blunt uh, just a couple of days ago about that very question. They don't seem to be terribly concerned about minefields, Peter. Uh, I mean, I suspect they may find some as we move deeper into the country. Uh, but here, uh, as you heard from, uh, from Colonel Bayer, uh, they've had pretty good intelligence, and they've been scoping this place out for a long, long time. And I think they're very confident of what they're going to find in the next few miles. Now, just last night... There was uh, 
not exactly a tank battle because it was only the Iraqi tanks on one side uh, and I suspect they were using the Apache Longbow helicopters on the other, uh, but they destroyed some 11 Iraqi tanks here last night. Apparently the uh, Iraqi army had moved down uh, a, uh, a tank company uh, in an effort, I suppose, to try and impede this crossing, uh, but those tanks are no more. You mentioned that at the very beginning of your report. Do we know how deep into the country the 11 tanks were? And finally, at least for this report, are you free to go forward at any time you want now and join that column? Uh, yes, we'll uh, we'll be right in the middle of that, uh, right in the middle of that dust. And uh, I can assure you, Peter, we'll try and pull in behind something small, but there isn't anything small out here. So is it your inclination to go forward now and, and check in with us a little later on? Uh, well, what I'm going to try and do, uh, General Blunt was going to go up in his, uh, in his helicopter. I don't know whether it's clear enough for him to get an overview, but uh, if he was going to go up in his Black Hawk, I was going to go up with him and take a camera. And when I come down, we'll try and hook up with our satellite track again. And uh, you can... Uh, you can be the appreciative audience <laughs> while I bring you my vacation pictures. Now, oh, Ted, that's a great briefing. Congratulations to all of you. Thanks to right. Alex Bruckner and to his uh, wife, your sound recordist, and all your unit there. And we'll check with you next time you have a chance. I hope that'll be in the next couple of hours. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Ted. Ted Koppel with the 3rd Infantry Division in southern Iraq, uh, having uh, a very... Uh, moving experience for him and his crew and for all of those members of the 3rd Infantry Division in southern Iraq at the moment. Um, and they'll check back in as they move forward. And it is, a, it is an example of two things you're seeing there, or many things, but it's certainly an example of two other things, and that is the astonishing technology which all of us now have on the battlefield. Um, here is an ABC News crew able to pull up to the very edge of the Iraqi Kuwait frontier, set up house momentarily and uh, point to the skies and broadcast live in impeccable quality as if they were down the street. Um, it isn't like that for everybody. On the other hand, some forces are moving very quickly. Mike Saray is on the eastern side of this front. Just let me just very quickly review. Um, so Ted, the, the tanks are across, the Bradley fighting vehicles are across. The colonel confirms there are now eight um, crossing points at which the 3rd Infantry is moving across at the moment. Uh, they think it'll take about 20 to 24 hours to get all of these men and vehicles across. Uh, but as General Nash uh, pointed out, as they get across and they get out into a flatter, broader plain, particularly in the western side of it, uh, they can move at a greater rate of speed than they have getting through those uh, through those berm breaks that they have created, as the colonel said, uh, throughout the night. And Tony Cordesman, of course, made the point as they get inland, uh, the terrain is going to get a little more difficult, particularly if they hang in the center of the country and don't swing wide, and they get up around the city of Nasaria there. Uh, the, the, the terrain gets a little uh, trickier, and they will need that bi bridge building equipment that they were or they were not testing right conveniently in front of our cameras. Farther to the east, the Marines were across the border uh, first, uh, and our, one of our reporters with them, of course, is Mike Saray, who's been up many times. They're traveling at a very high rate of speed, as best we could tell, and I think we can make contact with Mike again. Mike? Don't come to us. Don't come to them. Okay. We'll hang, we'll, we'll hang on for just a second and go to Tony Cordesman, our military analyst. Tony, so now we have two uh, considerable forces of, of uh, American uh, fighting men and their vehicles across that southern border. What happens now? Well, Peter, we don't know the line of advance, and I should stress that. But if it's the Marine Force, there are a lot of ways they can go. They could go up along the rivers here, there's a major road net they can go up here, but it's probable that they're not going to go up the same line that the Army might occupy. As for the Army, it has the choice. It can go along the desert, but I should note that as you get further and further to the west, the desert isn't smooth anymore. There are a lot of hills, rough areas, the terrain gets worse, or they can find a way to cross the river and get into the major road net. And there are a lot of places they can do it. So really, we're watching a very flexible line of advance. 
And I think sometimes we talk about, well, there can't be any tactical surprise. Well, the fact is there can be tactical surprise because the Iraqis don't know how we're going to make that line of advance. Not only do they not know where we're going to hit them, but what's equally important, they have no way to know what the 101st is going to do with its attack helicopters, its air mobility, or where the 82nd Airborne is going. So we're, I think we're going to see a lot of tactical surprise over the next few days. Okay, Tony, thanks very much. My thanks to Tony Cordesman, thanks to Ted Koppel, who were on the, uh, on the move at the moment, and so is Mike Saray, who is farther to the east with the Marines. I think we can now make contact. Mike? Yes, Peter, we were thinking that this invasion would start right about this time. In fact, it started nine hours earlier, and we've been on the move all night long, covering much ground through southern Iraq, and the opposition has not been that difficult so far. I'd like to bring in Lieutenant Colonel Mike Ohl, who is the battalion commander of this tank battalion who led it. Uh, Colonel, any surprises on this first invasion effort? Well, I think intelligence uh, painted a picture to us that uh, there wouldn't be real significant contact along our axis of attack, um, and that pretty much held true. So no real surprises, other than it went off at night. Didn't originally expect it to go off at night, but uh, that complicated matters some. Colonel, when we last spoke, it was supposed to be starting about now, and it ended up starting about nine hours ago. What made you kick it off early? Well, the thought was that we would uh, do a sequential attack, is my understanding. Uh, again, I can't speak for the people making all those decisions, but uh, uh, the understanding was a sequential attack to relieve some pressure in another area that was being attacked. So rather than both go at the same time, we would go one time and sort of put the enemy on his heels a little bit and uh, let the other attack take place later. So. Peter, we'll try to get to probably the issues that the American audience is most interested in, and that is casualties. I know neither you nor I have that much information because we've been rolling. We just got out of the tank a few minutes ago. Okay. Any indications of any casualties along your route of access? Not that I know of, not along our route. I can only speak for my battalion. We were the uh, point of main effort uh, heading north, and uh, no casualties within my battalion. We had a pretty uneventful trip. What about enemy contact? How many vehicles did you confront and had to destroy? Well, we're still totaling those numbers and it's difficult to tell at night uh, at long ranges what was occupied, what wasn't. But uh, best count right now is seven armored vehicles we destroyed, uh, a mix of personnel carriers and tanks, older vintage tanks, T-55 types. Uh, only a couple of those for sure we know were uh, with actual, actual functioning tanks. Once we came up on them, we realized they were functioning tanks. Now, Colonel, I heard one report that one of your tank company commanders confronted a group as large as 200 Iraqis uh, with white sheets over their tents and their hands up as he passed right on through them. Yes, we bypassed those. Uh, we appeared, they appeared as if they weren't a threat. Uh, we're an armor force. I don't have a EPW capability at this point in time, so uh, we had no option but to pass them by, report them back that they're there. We gave a grid location where they were at the higher headquarters. How were the Marines trying to do this? I noticed in the vehicle I was in, I saw two trucks pass by, look like military trucks filled with people, and both Marines locked and loaded but did not fire. What were they trained to do? Well, they're trained to make, uh, make good decisions, and that obviously was one good decision. I mean, they look and they determine, is that person a threat to me? And if that person isn't a threat to an M1A1 tank, uh, they're not going to pull the trigger on it. So in that case, they made, they made an assessment that that was not a threat. So. Colonel, the biggest threat that they had was the chemical suits. There's been no indication of any chemical warfare. We have been in these suits now for about 12 hours. It's been a long time, hasn't it? We've been, <laughs> we've been throwing out together. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. I mean, no question about it. But, you know, it's something that we know the uh, Saddam Hussein's got the stuff. So uh, we just have to take every precaution, precaution possible just to make sure that the boys don't get hurt here. So. Now, Colonel, we can't say where we are right now, but jets are flying overhead. We hear some artillery in the background. I presume they are ours. Uh, that is uh, that is a very good presumption. Absolutely, yes. And I must explain it probably to your wife as to, can you tell the story behind the mustaches that we're all supposed to be wearing? Well, there was some, uh, some thought that uh, the Iraqis might have had our uniforms, and uh, so the thought was, was that we would grow mustaches and then shave them off at the last minute so that anybody with a mustache in our uniform would be considered hostile. So, Colonel, do we have permission to shave our mustaches now? Uh, yes, we do. I'm looking forward to a nice hot shave at some point in the future. So. All right. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, Peter, do you have any questions of the Colonel? No, I think you've done a wonderful job, Mike. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Peter. Mike Suri, who's been traveling, uh, traveling through the night, making it clear, I, I think they can't tell us where they are, but if you think about it, they were traveling at a fairly decent rate of knots. I think they crossed the line of departure about seven hours ago. <clears throat> Just review a little bit of, of what they said. They were a little surprised they went, uh, they went when they went. They think they did not intend to go absolutely at night, though much of the early advertising about this campaign was that the U.S. would prefer to go at night because they have such a distinct advantage over the Iraqis. They've met no significant resistance along on the way that we knew from Mike's earlier report they were just barreling along uh, wherever they were going um, we're not altogether sure Tony Curtis what does it mean a sequential attack it means that people are going together are going sort of side by side with one ahead of the other and he wanted to relieve some pressure on a unit to one side or the other that's part of it Peter or you can have two lines of maneuver where one is driving forward while the other is regrouping Remember, these can move independently as brigades or battalions. It doesn't have to move as an entire division. Okay, Tony, thank you very much indeed, and I appreciate that. And just listening to the colonel there, no casualties, at least on his route. Um, they did have some contact uh, with Iraqis, and I thought I heard him say they, they killed, to use the parlance. Uh, it's a little cold-blooded at times, but it's military parlance. They encountered and destroyed seven armored vehicles which I thought he said was a mixture of tanks, T-55s, uh, Russian tanks, which the Iraqi army use, and some other vehicles. Um, they've been in those, uh, those chemical suits for a long period of time, and when you're fully dressed up in them, it is deeply uncomfortable in the back of one of the fighting vehicles. They use the light armored vehicle, the Marines, to go forward. Uh, but they're going to keep them on for the foreseeable future. Um, and you heard that rather touching bit at the end about the actual moustaches. Now, also with the Marines, as ABC's Bob Woodruff, they have, after a long wait at the border, also crossed into Iraq. Bob, can you tell us your circumstances? Well, Peter, it appears that the, that the large mechanized units have come through and cleared out a lot of the mines that they were worried about allowing us to finally pass through the berm. We just went over the border through the berm, as you know so much about now, about, uh, oh, maybe 25, about 25 seconds ago. We just got through. We're now rolling through with the uh, light armored reconnaissance team that we've got. We've also picked up a, rec a regular reconnaissance team, which is uh, essentially like the special forces of the Marines. And we are now moving on to our positions inside uh, of Iraq. The landscape is very barren. There's little spots of grass here and there. Uh, but it is a lot of sand, and we are heading in at about uh, 10 kilometers an hour. Okay, Bob, thanks very much indeed. Uh, do you want, to, you want to add anything? I must confess I've got several things going on at the moment. Uh, do you see uh, evidence of, uh, of, of air activity? Just as, as uh, Mike Suri was finishing there, they heard some, some air activity going north. It's some of the first we've heard. No, I have not seen any air activity lately. There has been, uh, there, ha there were some choppers flying overhead, but these were the command and control Hueys uh, that are essentially uh, controlling the air war for the Marines here uh, on the, in the forward position. I did not see any attack helicopters or, or aircraft or fixed wing aircraft flying overhead lately. Okay, Bob, thanks very much. Please come back at, uh, at your leisure when you can report. I want to digress now from from the ground campaign to read something which may be, uh, which may be tremendously uh, significant. Uh, and it's an article uh, in the Washington Post tomorrow morning, uh, which uh, I've just been given the context of. It's got three bylines on it. Uh, all well-known reporters for the Washington Post, Walter Pincus, Dana Priest, and Bob Woodward. Um, and it says that which we were not 100% certain of, but had a great suspicion of throughout the day, that Saddam Hussein was the target of the bombing attack on the leadership compound, as it was described to us uh, in Baghdad uh, earlier today. And I'll just read it to you uh, in the first paragraph, and then I'll read you um, a, uh, a subsequent paragraph, which I think you'll find fascinating. U.S. intelligence officials believe that Iraqi President Saddam Hussein, possibly accompanied by one or both of his sons, was still inside a compound in southern Baghdad early yesterday when it was struck by a huge barrage of U.S. bombs and missiles. You know, there was a huge flight of cruise missiles used on this target, and two at least of these 2,000-pound bunker buster bombs that have not been used before. And then here are some 
quote just from the article. Quote, the preponderance of the evidence is he was there when the building blew up, according to one senior U.S. official with access to sensitive intelligence. The official added that Hussein's sons, Hussein and Uday, Hussein the older, Uday the younger, uh, may also have been at the compound. Senior administration officials said of the Iraqi president, he didn't get out beforehand. Quote again, a third administration official said, quote, there is evidence that he, Hussein, Saddam Hussein, was at least injured because of indications that medical attention was urgently summoned on his behalf. The condition of Hussein's sons and any others who may have been in the compound at the time was unknown, officials said. Um, then there was a, there's a paragraph which is a little bit, I think, related uh, to the business of having seen Saddam Hussein on the television earlier. And the government consulted a woman named Parasula Lamsos. You've seen her on ABC before because ABC's Claire Shipman did a long uh, interview with her and spent some time with her. Um, she is described as one of Saddam Hussein's longtime mistresses. Uh, the Defense Department uh, believes that she has successfully passed a polygraph examination. And she has previously dis been able to distinguish uh, Saddam Hussein from several of his doubles in more than a dozen cases. And this time she says that he was not the man in the television broadcast. That's the Washington Post, the first edition for tomorrow, which is already beginning to move uh, uh, on the Internet. And um, that is as much as we know. But it, it, it dovetails and then goes beyond a fair amount of the speculation and analysis about what actually happened when the U.S. hit this target of opportunity. Remember, this is something the president signed off on uh, last night at 6 o'clock. They needed about four hours warning to get, as, uh, as our analysts have told us, to get the cruise missiles configured um, and on their way for a long flight from the Persian Gulf and or the Red Sea. They are now guided, um, unlike the old ones, which sort of basically had maps in their noses, topographical maps, they're now guided by the global positioning satellites, which have made the entire operation in this war so different. And if I were to summarize it, which is a little unfair to the Post, uh, just in that one paragraph, the preponderance of the evidence is that he was in the building when it blew up. This is one, one senior U.S. official with access to intelligence. And he didn't get out beforehand, said another senior official. And Bob Woodward, who is one of the reporters on that particular article, along with uh, two others, I said good reporters, Dana Priest and Walter Pincus, is going to be on Good Morning America tomorrow morning to talk about that in much greater detail. I want to go to Washington and ABC's Martha Raddatz because she has been working this story for, for many hours. Um, as we say in, in our trade, Martha, can you match, uh, can you match some of that? I, I think I certainly can, Peter. Good. We reported several hours ago that intelligence official, officials believed Saddam Hussein was in that residential compound, was in the bunker, and they believed he was with his two sons, just like the Washington Post. There is some contradiction here between officials. Some officials believe that Saddam Hussein was hit. Others are not so sure. They, as you said, are looking at this tape. Indeed, some believe that was Saddam Hussein in the tape. Some don't believe it was Saddam Hussein in the tape. So this is still very much in play. But intelligence sources very solidly say they believe Saddam Hussein was in that bunker, in that residential compound at the time probably sleeping there with his sons because it was in the middle of the night. Okay, Martha, thank you very much indeed. So there you are with that. And now, as we've told you, or as we've said many times, not told you, said many times in the course of this coverage, that one of the first casualties of any campaign is truth. It's sometimes inadvertent. Um, we reported uh, some time ago, based on a British pool report from the BBC, that on the Sea King helicopter, which crashed inside Kuwait, there were according to the British Broadcasting Corporation, four British and 12 Americans. The Pentagon now says that there were four Americans and 12 Britons, uh, 12 uh, from the British forces who were killed in the crash of a Marine helicopter. Um, there has been confusion about the numbers all night. I, the first thought that comes to anybody's mind is how deeply hard this is on Marine families uh, who are watching uh, television throughout the country. I think 
you know, some of them try to steal themselves before a campaign like this begins for the worst kind of news, and they have great support groups, and they manage to stay in touch with their men in the field, but it, up to a certain point, but it is very difficult. And the Pentagon now says that four Americans and 12 members of the British forces were killed in that crash of a Marine helicopter in Kuwait, not the other way around, as the British reported it some time ago. But we are still trying to get it absolutely 100% confirmed. We do believe they are the first casualties of this campaign. And as you heard just a little while ago from the Marine colonel who uh, was talking to uh, with Mike there, is that they haven't suffered any casualties on their part, and the 3rd Infantry Division in the West has just gone across the border. So this is ABC News continuing live coverage of the war with Iraq. Peter Jennings at ABC News headquarters again, and we have been listening with uh, real fascination in the last little while to my colleague Ted Koppel, who is with the 3rd Infantry Division as they cross the line of departure on the Iraqi-Kuwait border, and I think we can listen to him again for just a couple of minutes. live in Baghdad, so we're not able to hear uh, Ted there for the moment, but let you, given that it is 11 o'clock Eastern Time, 8 o'clock in the Pacific, 7 o'clock, 7.01 in Baghdad, we've been looking at this picture out of the corner of our eye here for the last hour or so.